So in this chapter nine, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about inflammation and immunity. And we're going to first start out here with the innate defenses of immunity. Uh, the innate immune response requires no previous exposure to effectively respond to a given antigen. And if you all remember from previous classes, uh, antigens are basically a molecule that can stimulate an immune response. And these antigens can be things like proteins, glycoproteins, glycolipids, something that the immune system can recognize as being foreign. Um, now, the innate defenses include a series of cells like natural killer cells, which are type of lymphocyte, and other phagocytic cells, so the cells that can engulf foreign debris and microorganisms, including neutrophils and macrophages. Remember, the neutrophils are the most abundant immune cell in your white blood cells. So the, these neutrophils here um, are part of your innate defense, which means your innate defense is pretty widespread. So the specific defenses differ than the innate defenses because these specific defenses respond more effectively upon second exposure to a particular antigen. Also, these specific defenses are highly selective and can only respond to one antigen, um, one specific type of antigen. Now, these specific defenses involve the B and T lymphocytes, which we'll go into more detail here in a little bit. And um, this has to be learned. So we talk about the specific immune defenses as being learned or adaptive because they uh, develop upon exposure to a new foreign antigen. Now, part of our immune defense relates to different barriers like epithelial barriers. So it turns out that uh, even before your immune cells start to fight off foreign debris or microorganisms, your skin and mucous membranes act as a first line of defense. Uh, for one reason you know, being that the skin epithelium here produces molecules called defensins, which can basically punch holes in bacterial membranes. Um, and the, on top of the fact too, that skin is a really tough and protective barrier so that bacteria or other microorganisms can't just wiggle through in between your skin cells. Uh, the intestinal epithelium, you know, along your GI tract, produces cryptosidins, which are just a class of molecules that, again, are antimicrobial. Now, uh, disruption of these normal epithelial barriers, like disruption of the skin epithelium or intestinal epithelium, can increase the likelihood that a pathogen can establish an infection. So you're more likely to get an infection of skin if there's a wound in skin, you know, where that skin epithelium barrier is not compromised, or an infection of the gut if there's some sort of ulcer or wound within the gut mucosal wall. Now, uh, we're going to first talk about the macrophages, which are part of your innate immune response. Uh, these macrophages are powerful phagocytes, and they clean up dead neutrophils and inflammatory debris, so they basically help remove any dead tissue or dead cells, and therefore have a role in wound healing. Now, macrophages, again, are part of your innate immune response, and so they're not specific. They can just remove a wide variety of antigens in debris and microorganisms. Now, most of your immune cells are derived from um, the lymphoid system here, and uh, it involves a series of organs like bone marrow and your thymus gland. So we know that bone marrow, especially red bone marrow in particular, has a variety of stem cells that give rise to all of your white blood cells. So the lymphocytes and the rest of your immune cells all come from red bone marrow. Now, many of these immune cells will develop uh, in different areas of your body, including, including bone marrow or your thymus. T cells in particular develop in the thymus. And the thymus is a large gland. It's most active before puberty, but it's a large gland that sits in the mediastinum, just superior to your heart. Now, the lymphocytes are produced from stem cells, and this includes T and B lymphocytes. Now, T lymphocytes migrate, migrate to the thymus to develop whereas B cells and natural killer cells will stay in your red bone marrow during development. And what I mean by development is that they need to grow and become immunocompetent, or basically be able to effectively fight infection and recognize foreign antigens. Now, there are other secondary organs like lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, and Peyer's patches, which you find in your intestine, which are also involved in immune defense because they contain uh, high concentrations of lymphocytes. So you're going to find a lot of lymphocytes, so T, B, and natural killer cells in lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, and Peyer's patches.
So what this slide is showing is basically just a, a general overview of your lymphatic system. And if you all remember from A&P, the lymphatic system is a series of uh, vessels that you find in most tissues of your body, except for bone and teeth. But these lymph vessels will pick up excess fluid from the tissues and then slowly carry that excess fluid back towards your heart where then the, the lymph is then mixed back in with your bloodstream. Now what's important to note though with respect to the immune system is that your lymphoid system is uh, basically also rich in a lot of lymphocytes or immune cells. So as that excess fluid gets carried back towards your bloodstream, it's also cleaned up along the way. So if there's any debris or microorganisms in that fluid, uh, the lymphocytes here in lymph nodes and lymph vessels will help, will help clear those out, um, ideally, before it goes back into your bloodstream and then to the rest of your body. Now, what this is showing you guys are just the, the main types of leukocytes, and leukocytes are basically just your white blood cells. Now, all of these are derived from stem cells you find in red bone marrow. And the major type of leukocytes we have are the neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and the basophils. Now, this, show, this is actually in order of their abundance, uh, normal abundance, in the bloodstream. So normally, you should find 60 to 80% of your white blood cells are neutrophils. 20 to 30% of your white blood cells are lymphocytes, so B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells include the lymphocytes. Uh, 3 to 8% are monocytes, which include macrophages. Uh, 1 to 6% are eosinophils, and then 0 to 2% are basophils, which are the most, are most uncommon or least abundant. Now, in terms of just the general functions of each of these types of leukocytes, uh, the neutrophils are first to appear after injury, and they're involved with phagocytosis. Remember, the neutrophils are part of your innate immune response, so they're not specific, nor are they adaptive or learned. They uh, more broadly respond to a lot of different foreign antigens, debris, or tissue damage. And again, these are the most abundant. Uh, the lymphocytes include your B cells and T cells, which are part of your learned or adaptive immunity, or specific immunity, and they respond to one antigen. But the lymphocytes also include natural killer cells, which are part of your um, innate immune response. Now, monocytes are a type of mobile macrophage. The monocytes are a macrophage, or big eater, that basically float around the bloodstream, and they remain in their inactive form until they encounter uh, you know, infected tissue or inflammation, where these monocytes then can activate into macrophages and then enter that infected or inflamed tissue and then participate in phagocytosis. And if you all remember from previous slides, remember the macrophages are part of your uh, specific, I'm not specific, I'm sorry, they're part of your innate immune response. So the eosinophils here, uh, one to six percent of your immune cells, these are involved in allergic reactions and parasitic infections. And so what's interesting is that these are uh, potential targets with you know allergies and autoimmune disease because for whatever reason these cells seem to play a role uh, w if they're overactive they seem to play a role in you know uh, excessive amounts of allergy even even the autoimmune response and so there's a there's an interesting hypothesis out there that talks about how you can use parasites possibly to treat auto autoimmune disease and we may come back to that later now the basophils uh, have a lot of histamine granules, so they contain a lot of histamine. Now histamine is a type of molecule that's released during the inflammatory response and during the allergy response. So basophils are important during um, inflammation. So if you inhibit basophils, then you inhibit the release of histamine and therefore reduce things like allergic reactions or inflammation. And again, we'll come back to these later. So we'll first talk about the neutrophils here. Neutrophils, remember, are the most abundant of the leukocytes, also called the polymorphonuclear leukocytes, or PMLs. Now, these are important in acute, acute bacterial infections, and they release toxins like free radicals, defensins, and enzymes, such as elastase. And although these cells normally help to remove dead and damaged tissue as well as clear out infection, they can also damage normal tissue. So excessive neutrophil activities can also damage healthy tissue uh, near their site of activity. So there's, there's a little bit of um, collateral damage there, but you know it's all, it's all in good effort, I guess. Now the lymphocytes include natural killer cells, T cells, and B cells. Of these three, it's the T and B cells that are involved with your specific or learned immune response, whereas the natural killer cells are part of your innate immune response. So 
meaning that they can respond to many different antigens and are less specific. Uh, these natural killer cells you find in circulation and they can migrate from blood into an infected tissue when necessary. The T and B cells are lymphocytes that are part of your specific or adaptive immunity and they all play different roles in the immune response. So we'll talk about the, the specific types of T cells that are involved with immunity as well as the specific types of B cells that are involved with immunity. But what's important to note in this slide is that T cells mature in the thymus, B cells mature in bone marrow. So if someone has damage to the thymus or bone marrow, it can affect the development of these cells. Now, um, there are two major classes of T lymphocytes. And remember, the T lymphocytes are part of your specific adaptive or learned immune response. So these two major classes include the T helper and cytotoxic T cells. Uh, it's the T helper cells that are, have CD4 proteins. Uh, these have a function or role in activating other T cells and macrophages. They can also stimulate B cells um, by releasing inflammatory cytokines. So when these helper T cells release cytokines, it can activate B cells to release what we call antibodies. And we'll come back to that later. So think about the T cells in the immune response as, as sort of like the cheerleaders of the immune response. You know, they don't participate directly in fighting infection. Rather, they can release a lot of cytokines when they recognize infection or tissue damage that can activate other immune cells. So these T helper cells, once they release cytokines, they can go on and activate things like cytotoxic T cells or even the B cells, which we'll talk about soon. Now the cytotoxic T cells are CD8 positive and they do function in killing off uh, particular cells that contain certain antigens. However, these cytotoxic T cells require signals or cytokines to be released by the T helper cells in order to function normally. Now the CD4 proteins and CD8 proteins you find on cytotoxic T cells, uh, these are important types of proteins uh, involved with recognizing foreign antigens but what's interesting about these CD4 proteins is that HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, only infects cells that are CD4 positive. So specifically, it's the T helper cells that are affected during the uh, HIV infection. So if HIV infects T helper cells, basically what HIV is doing is diminishing your immune system's ability to get the rest of the immune system excited because now there's less T helper cells to release pro-inflammatory cytokines, which means that other immune cells like your cytotoxic T cells or B cells are less responsive to infection. And that's a sort of insidious thing about uh, HIV infection. So the B lymphocytes are also part of your specific adaptive or learned immune response. And they have antibody-like receptors on their cell surface. They carry many copies of identical B cell receptors. And like the T cells, they can only respond to one type of antigen. Now, these B cells can produce memory cells. So once you form a certain type of B cell, some of the cells actually will form clones that actually become inactive and they kind of go dormant in different areas of your body. That way you have a learned or a memory of the infection if you ever encounter that infectious organism again later. Now, many of these B lymphocytes can survive for months to years, which is why upon subsequent exposure to the same antigen, your immune system can really respond rapidly to that same antigen it's seen uh, previously. Now, for a typical B cell, you know, we got B cell receptors and they can respond to an antigen. Now, what's interesting here then is that once these B cells recognize a foreign antigen, their role then is to really make antibodies. So an activated B cell will turn into a clone called a plasma cell, which is basically just an antibody factory. And it starts pumping out antibodies to attack uh, you know, foreign antigens. Now, um, some other aspects of your uh, innate immune response include what we call complement. So complement includes 20 different plasma proteins, which are typically synthesized mostly by the liver, macrophages, and neutrophils. And these 20 different plasma proteins have really important roles in your innate immune response. So they do things like enhance inflammation. They can actually lyse or break apart target cells. They can actually attract other immune cells to a site of inflammation or infection. Or they can also target foreign cells for removal by um, you know, immune cells. Uh, 
So you can see here that once these uh, complement proteins become activated, they have these specific functions here. And so it's important then that you have normal liver function, macrophage function, and neutrophil function to make a sufficient amount of complement proteins to you know, bring this aspect of, of uh, the immune system um, in. Now what this is showing are one of the complement cascades. And to me, this is one of the most interesting aspects of, of complement, where when you have a target cell, and it's maybe recognized as being uh, foreign or cancerous, What's really interesting then is these complement proteins um, can activate in response to antibodies binding to a foreign antigen here. Once these complement proteins activate, they start to arrange in really interesting orientation where they form this thing called a membrane attack complex or MAC attack complex. And basically what this MAC attack complex does is it sticks a big old hole in the cell membrane of a foreign cell. And by having a huge hole then in the cell, it actually causes the cell to rush in with water. The cell will swell and then burst or lice open. So basically, if a foreign cell encounters the complement cascade, it can explode because this MAC attack complex sticks holes in its membrane and therefore allows an excessive amount of water to rush in and this whole cell explodes like the Death Star. <laughs> so it's actually pretty cool how this uh, complement cascade works in the immune response. Now something else that's interesting too are, is that uh, there are chemical mediators of immune function and these chemical mediators are basically a series of chemicals that are released by damaged tissue or activated immune cells and um, some of these include the kinins. Um, some of the kinins include things like bradykinin or calidin and what these chemical mediators do is they act in, in different ways like they promote vasodilation which can increase blood flow to a particular tissue and therefore bring in more immune cells. They can activate inflammation. They can activate the clotting cascade. They can increase vascular permeability, which does a couple things like dilute, it dilutes out bacteria and toxins in a tissue, but it also helps bring in um, more immune cells to an inflamed or infected tissue. Uh, these kinins are also involved with smooth muscle contractions, which help form blood clots. And it turns out that the kinins are also associated with pain. So if you have an infection or an inflamed portion of tissue, um, the pain that can be associated with that is typically caused by the release of these kinins. Now, what this is showing is the, the pathway that leads to the production of kinins. And what's odd about this pathway is that it requires something called Hageman factor. And going back to the clotting cascade, you guys remember that Hageman factor is the common factor that's necessary for both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways of your clotting cascade. So what's also interesting then is that, yes, this Hageman factor, once it's activated, does promote coagulation of blood. However, it also promotes the production of kinins, like bradykinin, that do things like give you a sense of pain, promote inflammation, and also promote vasodilation, which can increase blood flow to an, uh, an infected or inflamed tissue. So it turns out that the complement cascade, uh, which is involved with both coagulation as well as the immune system, also promotes pain, inflammation, and vasodilation. Now, clotting factors do function in stop, in to stop bleeding. We talked about that. However, we, we just learned in the previous slide that they're involved with inflammation and triggering, triggering the kinin system as well. So there's an interesting interplay between all these different systems uh, of uh, clotting factors, as well as uh, you know inflammation, pain, and um, uh, you know coagulation of blood. Now, other chemical mediators of your immune function include substances like cytokines and chemokines, and these are basic chemicals that can act as chemotactic factors. Now, chemotaxis literally means chemical movement. And it's not necessarily the movement of those chemicals, but rather they're chemicals that can attract the movement of other immune cells to the site of inflammation or infection. And so what these chemotactic factors can do then is enhance and coordinate innate and specific immune defenses. They can activate complex intracellular communication networks as well as uh, affect the functioning of other nearby cells. So that these chemotactic factors do play an important role in the innate defense and inflammation. In fact, when we talk about inflammation, it actually is part of your innate defense. 
So inflammation isn't always a bad thing. In fact, inflammation is part of a normal and healthy immune response. So there are three main purposes to the inflammatory response. For one, it's important for inflammation to neutralize and destroy invading and harmful agents. Inflammation also helps to limit the spread of harmful agents. And inflammation also sets up the tissue to be repaired. So these are the three important aspects of inflammation. But we do know that an excessive amount of inflammation can lead to uh, tissue damage. So uh, it turns out that inflammation occurs with any type of cell injury, whether it occurs exogenously or endogenously. Uh, an exogenous type of cell injury would be like if you get a cut and that, that it directly injures, injures the tissue. Otherwise, an endogenous type of cell injury would be like if cells um, you know, kill themselves somehow, you know, that can actually lead to certain types of inflammatory responses. And really any condition that, that ends with itis refer, refers to inflammation. So if we talk about vasculitis, that refers to inflammation of the vasculature, or appendicitis obviously would be inflammation of the appendix. So inflammation is associated with infection, but not always. You know, uh, sometimes you can just get inflammation from tissue damage, but not necessarily due to infection. But infections can cause inflammation, and we'll, we'll actually talk about um, how those are stimulated coming up soon. Now, there are five cardinal signs of inflammation, which include redness, swelling, heat, pain, and loss of function. Now the redness we call erythema. Erythema is just sort of a redness of skin or tissue. And that's one of the signs of inflammation. Um, what we see that, that also associated with inflammation would be swelling or just sort of um, where the tissue gets sort of in, uh, inflamed or swells with, with more fluid. Uh, it turns out, you guys, that uh, when there's an increase in blood flow to a particular area, you see that inflamed tissue gets hotter because there's more blood flow there. And due to the release of kinins, you see pain due to tissue damage. However, though, these do play important roles in those three aforementioned functions of inflammation. So helping to dilute out different factors, helping to dilute out bacteria, and also promoting um, healing of tissue. But if these occur in excess, it turns out that inflammation can lead to loss of function or basically tissue damage. So, you know, excessive inflammation is not a good thing. And this is why, you know, if there's a lot of inflammation in a particular part of your body, it may be important to take some sort of anti-inflammatory drug. Now there's two types of inflammation we'll, we'll differentiate, acute versus chronic. And you all remember going back to last week, we talked about how um, acute symptoms or uh, signs are short in duration, but often have uh, really dramatic initial effects. Uh, we define acute inflammation as lasting less than two weeks and often involves this discrete set of event, events like getting cut and then being acutely inflamed due to that cut or burn. However, chronic inflammation differs from acute inflammation because it's more diffuse, it's kind of more widespread throughout your body, it extends over longer periods of time, right, more than two weeks. It can result in scar tissue formation or deformity of that tissue. It can also lead to granuloma formation, which is basically kind of like a hardness of the tissue. So you get a little bit of loss of function of there as well. So in, in many cases, chronic inflammation can be, um, you know, more uh, dramatic or at least damaging to tissues versus acute inflammation. Now, there are three major events that occur uh, with the initial inflammatory response. For one, we see an increase in vascular permeability due to the fact that mast cells re uh, release vasoactive chemicals. Uh, you find these mast cells in tissue, and they basically just kind of monitor um, whether there are, uh, you know, um, uh, infectious microorganisms nearby, or if there's any tissue damage. If if either occurs, they'll release vasoactive chemicals like histamine, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes, which increase vascular permeability. What this means then is that blood vessels become more permeable or more leaky, so that some of the components in blood, like water or complement proteins, can start to leak out in the tissue, causing things like inflammation or swelling, as well as uh, bringing complement proteins that can aid in the process of the immune response. Now, uh, another event that occurs during inflammation is the immigration of leukocytes. What we find then is that due to the release of vasoactive chemicals, uh, this can attract leukocytes through chemotaxis so that white blood cells in the bloodstream can start to marginate 
or basically move through the blood vessel wall from blood into the tissue. It turns out these actually will move through a process called diapedesis where they kind of squeeze between cells and this is attracted through chemotaxis where these leukocytes, leukocytes can kind of sniff out or smell uh, these chemical markers of inflammation and they're attracted to those markers and therefore can leave blood and enter that inflamed tissue. Now the third event in inflammation is phagocytosis where we have neutrophils and macrophages. Remember this is part of your um, your uh, innate immune response. These produce proteolytic enzymes and oxidizing, oxidizing agents that help to break down the phagocytosed or digested material and therefore start to remove any foreign microorganisms or dead tissue um, away from a local area. Now these three events of inflammation you can see in here. So uh, what happens you guys with, in with inflammation, you get some sort of tissue injury. And we talked about that with tissue injury that leads to the, the uh, release of vasoactive chemicals that can lead to things like vasodilation. Uh, vasodilation will increase blood flow to that tissue, which allows for more white blood cells to enter that inflamed tissue and therefore participate in the phagocytic immune response. Otherwise, injury can also lead to the release of chemokines that can also promote phagocytosis, as well as uh, neutrophils and macroph macrophages leaving or marginating from the, from the bloodstream and entering uh, that infected tissue to also participate in phagocytosis. So you can see here then that there are multiple pathways that result from injury that all lead to phagocytosis or basically uh, engulfing of that debris or, or microorganisms that can, that can aid or participate in the immune response. And you might wonder, you know, well, why do you have three different pathways that do the same thing? Well, you know, we know that immune system or phagocytosis is such an important thing that you'd want some redundancy here. You want some backup plans where, let's say, if one fails, at least you have other mechanisms that can promote the same process. Now, remember, this should, the, we have the five cardinal signs of inflammation, which include pain, heat, redness, and swelling. And what this slide is showing are the different factors that lead to each of those uh, cardinal signs. And actually, one of the signs that's missing up here, because there's only four here, is the loss of function. So if you get too much pain, heat, redness, and swelling, that can lead to loss of function. But uh, the pain, the heat, the redness, and swelling are important aspects of the inflammatory immune response. So what happens then is that with tissue damage, we, we get the release of vasoactive and chemotactic factors, and these do a variety of things. For one, we know that vasoactive chemicals and chemotactic factors can lead to the production of pain um, through the kinin pathway so that you, you, know, you can get some pain um, due to the re release of these chemicals. It turns out that vasoactive chemicals can also promote vasodilation, and this vasodilation can increase blood flow, which actually will cause redness and heat, and too much blood flow also can lead to some pain due to swelling uh, in that tissue. Um, these chemotactic and vasoactive factors can also increase the permeability of your, of your blood vessels, which cause swelling in a local area, and that swelling uh, is involved in helping to dilute out any toxins, dilute out the bacteria, and also help bring in some of the uh, nutrients and complement proteins that aid in the process of the immune response here. And last but not least, you guys, that the vasoactive and chemo chemotactic factors also promote the emigration of neutrophils from your bloodstream into that tissue which also release um, a series of factors that promote swelling. Now, too much pain, heat, and swelling, and redness uh, can lead to loss of function, which um, can damage tissue. So again, you know, inflammation is, part in a, is an important part of your immune response. However, too much inflammation um, can lead to uh, damage of your body's tissues. So the fluid that is actually gonna be um, coming from the increased vascular permeability we call inflammatory exudate. So the inflammatory exudates are due to the transport of leukocytes and antibodies. Um, so this basically allows for these substances to come from blood into the tissue. Um, it's also involved with diluting toxins and irrigating substances, as well as transportation of nutrients into the inflamed tissue for its repair. So exudation, inflammatory exudate, is basically just the fluid that leaks from those, those uh, permeable vessels 
remember the it's the chemotactic and cytokines that really that increase the uh, permeability of blood vessels. So what is what is uh, emigration and margination look like? Well, it turns out that once these cytokines are released by activated macrophages, um, they're going to travel on over to the blood vessel wall here. And once they travel to the blood vessel wall, uh, they can activate a series of receptors that then allow for leukocytes then to roll across the blood vessel wall, stick to that activated receptor with the chemokine. Once this blood cell, cell is stuck to the blood vessel wall, it can start to squeeze its way through or marginate through in between two cells and then enter the infected or inflamed tissue. Uh, once in the infected or inflamed tissue, you know, it'll attach to the extracellular matrix within that tissue and then allow, um, basically walk around the tissue and, and find any microorganisms or um, dead cells to remove. Now, the process of phagocytosis, which we talked about was mediated by things like macrophages and neutrophils, is kind of an interesting and uh, can be a complex process. But what happens is, let's say if the immune cell here uh, phagocytoses a microbe. Well, what, that, what happens then is it puts it into what we call a phagosome, which is basically just a, a vesicle that results from phagocytosis that contains your microbe within it. And then what happens is the immune cell, like a neutrophil or macrophage, will fuse lysosomes with this phagosome to form what we call a phagolysosome. Now remember, lysosomes are full of lots of different enzymes and acid that can act to basically uh, break down this foreign microbe here. And it can do this through a process of like antioxidants or enzymes and even acid that basically break down the chemical structure of the uh, basically the microbe inside of this phagolysosome. Once the microbe's broken down, then you know the cell can recycle those components. And that's how these microbes are removed from the body. Now, there are some systemic manifestations of inflammation. We know that the local inflammation, uh, signs of symptoms of inflammation include those five cardinal signs we talked about. So the redness, heat, the pain, the swelling, and the loss of function, which are associated with both acute and chronic inflammation. However, local inflammation can lead to systemic involvement because some of the inflammatory molecules that are released by an inflamed tissue can make it into your bloodstream. Uh, once they go systemic, these inflammatory molecules can do things like induce fever by basically resetting your hypothalamus to run your body temperature a little higher than normal. Uh, it can also uh, increase the production of neutrophils um, and cause you to feel more lethargic. And it can also increase muscle catabolism. So remember, Catabolism means the breakdown, so your body can start to use uh, protein and muscle for energy. Now, one of the markers of acute uh, inflammation is called C-reactive protein. And so C-reactive protein is one of those blood markers for acute inflammation. And we can also measure how much inflammation someone has in their body in a laboratory setting by measuring their erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR. And if their ESR um, is higher, this will increase with inflammation. Now, the specific immune system uh, is, remember, part of your immune system that can respond to a specific antigen. Now, although when we just talked about the inflammatory response, that was part of your innate uh, immune response, the specific adaptive immune response could be activated as well if those microbes hung around the tissue long enough to be recognized by a B cell or a T cell. So these B cells and T cells, which are part of your specific adaptive immunity, recognize foreign invaders and they act to destroy those foreign invaders. What's also interesting too is they can retain a memory of, of that encounter. That way if you're subsequently exposed to those foreign invaders, um, this gonna, is going to allow for a more effective and quick uh, secondary immune response the next time you're exposed to that microorganism. So the main cell types that are involved with a specific adaptive immune response are your B cells and T cells. Uh, B cells are involved with humoral immunity. The reason why we call it humoral immunity is that the humors of your body, your body fluids, and B cells release antibodies into your body fluids to basically find and attach to foreign 
microbes or antigens. Now T cells we call cell mediated immunity because the T cells are involved with specifically targeting um, foreign cells. Now one of the challenges that B cells and T cells must uh, undergo is differentiating self from non-self. You know, how do B cells and T cells recognize that a that a cell belongs in your body? So we call it a self cell. Or how does it recognize that a cell is foreign or non-self? Now it does this through what we call the major histocompatibility complex, um, also called the human leukocyte antigen or HLA. Um, each individual person has their own HLA markers that mark their own body's cells as self. It turns out that your, your individual and unique HLA markers are dependent on your genotype. And last week we talked about how you know inheritance patterns and that kind of stuff. So everyone on the planet, unless they're identical twins, has their own um, unique HLA, which basically marks their body cells as self. Now, no one has the same MHC unless they're identical twins. And this is because of uh, genetic recombination, which occurs during meiosis, where you get sort of shuffling of genes. And so even for close relatives like brothers and sisters, which you know presumably have the same genes, the thing is, though, is that they inherit different combinations of the types of those genes or forms of those genes from their parents due to shuffling of genes during meiosis. So even if you have a brother and sister um, that you inherited your DNA from the same parents, you have different forms of those genes from each parent, which means you're even though you're interrelated, you're also slightly different. Now, MHC comes from basically your, your genome, so your chromosomes, and there's different classes of MHC. We have class one, two, and three. Class one MHC are basically receptors for antigen presentation for nucleated cells. Class two MHC are receptors for antigen presentation found on macrophages and B cells. And class three MHC are used for complement components and other immune cells. Now, uh, nucleated cells all express MHC class one receptors on their cell surface. And this is important because cytotoxic cells can recognize these antigens um, on MHC class one cells and then recognize whether those cells are foreign or they belong in your cell. Other specialized cells like dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells express MHC class two proteins and these uh, play a role with the T helper cells in recognizing antigens uh, as being foreign or belonging to yourself. Now it turns out that nucleated cells are continuously producing MHC1 proteins by their endoplasmic reticulum and it turns out that as these are producing MHC class 1 proteins these actually will fuse with other protein fragments in the cytoplasm. So what's kind of odd is that these MHC class 1 proteins are used as a marker to kind of identify what's going on inside of cells because they're constantly binding with little fragments within those cells. Now what happens is these MHC class 1 proteins and those peptide fragments eventually get expressed on the cell surface and these are expected by T I'm sorry these are inspected by the T cells around the humors or fluids of your body. Now what's interesting here then is that these T cells then by recognizing MHC1 complexes uh, with the peptide fragments can really kind of see what's going on inside of your body cells uh, in real time. So the reason why this is important is that this is one of the ways that cytotoxic T cells can recognize whether a cell is virally infected or not. You know, because we know that viruses must get inside of a cell in order to divide. So how do we know whether our immune cells know if a, uh, a cell contains a virus or doesn't contain a virus. Well, once that virus enters a cell, you know, it takes its genome and starts to use the host cell machinery to make viral proteins. Now, it turns out those viral proteins will fuse with a class 1 MHC receptor, which then gets expressed on the cell surface. So basically, it's a way for the cell to show, hey, it has viral proteins inside of it. And this is one of the ways that these cytotoxic T cells can recognize whether there are viral proteins being expressed in a given cell of your body.
if this is the case, if a cytotoxic T cell recognizes that a cell is virally infected, this cytotoxic T cell then will initiate um, the process of uh, basically coordinated cell death, which is apoptosis. So cytotoxic T cells will then kill a virally infected cell, which is kind of interesting. Now this differs from the class 2 MHC proteins because MH, class 2 MHC proteins present antigens that are obtained from the extracellular sources. Remember, this differs from class 1 MHC because class 1 actually obtains proteins from within cells. Class 2 obtains proteins that you find outside of cells. So that these ones are associated with the, the phagocytic cells like neutrophils and macrophages. Now, it turns out these extracellular antigens or proteins must first be ingested by antigen-presenting cells like macrophages and neutrophils through a process of phagocytosis so that these um, macrophages and neutrophils will phagocytose any kind of extracellular debris. It'll basically fuse that with lysosome and chop this up into little bits. It can take those peptide fragments, fuse it with a class 2 MHC receptor, and then express that on its cell surface. This is one of the ways that these cells can present antigens to other immune cells to get the rest of the immune cell excited. Um, in some ways, it's kind of basically kind of showing what it caught. So once it catches this foreign protein, it'll chop it up, put it on an MHC2, MHC class 2 receptor, express, express that on its cell surface, and then say, hey, helper T cell, look what I found. And then the helper T cell will, will recognize this as being foreign, and then that will help initiate an immune response. Because if you remember, helper T cells release cytokines, which then can, then can activate the cytotoxic T cells and your B cells. So um, uh, it turns out that cell-mediated immunity involves your T cells, and uh, these T cells have their own specific receptors, and it's used to recognize foreign antigens that you find on antigen-presenting uh, cells. Now these T cells are specific, so they only recognize one specific type of antigen. But what this means then is that you have lots of different types of T cells that respond to their own specific type of antigen. And uh, what this allows for then is your immune system can recognize potentially millions or billions of different types of antigens uh, which may be foreign to your body. And we know that there's two types of T cells. We have the helper and cytotoxic T cells. And the function of these helper T cells, which are CD4 positive, is to release cytokines that activate other immune cells. And the cytotoxic T cells are the ones that directly participate in the immune response by basically, you know, directly targeting a foreign cell. So the T cells we talked about with CD4 positive, you know, these are involved with the MHC class 2 pathway. They're CD4 positive so that they're going to be you know, possibly infected by the HIV virus. And um, these recognize one specific type of antigen. And this differs from cytotoxic T cells because these are CD8 positive. Um, these are involved with the MHC class 1 pathway. Um, now, HIV does not infect CD8 positive cells, but HIV still has an, a dramatic effect on your immune system because you're removing the CD4 positive uh, uh, helper T cells, which are necessary to get the rest of your immune system excited. Now, uh, once these um, CD8 proteins um, are used with this MHC1 pathway, it can trigger a response that causes cytotoxic T cells um, to activate also other cells like T helper cells. And so uh, it turns out that it's not enough that you only have cytotoxic T cells recognizing something foreign. It also requires unique co-stimulation by interleukins and cytokines released by the helper T cells. So it's almost as though these cytotoxic T cells need other immune cells to kind of corroborate its story that it's recognizing a foreign microorganism. Now the cytotoxic T cells, um, once activated, can proliferate into memory cells and effector cells. The memory cells will remain dormant and store a memory of that infection, whereas the effector cells are the ones that are the, will participate directly in the immune response by targeting that foreign microorganism. And the way that these cytotoxic T cells remove foreign microorganisms, these effector cells do, is that they produce something called perforins. And these perforins are manufactured by cytotoxic T cells. 
and they basically uh, punch holes instead of foreign cells and then inject granzymes into the target cell, which degrades its DNA and allows for apoptosis or basically cell death to occur. So I like to think about these cytotoxic T cells as being like the grim reapers of your immune system because once they touch a foreign microorganism or uh, you know like a cancer cell, it can actually cause that cell to kill itself through a process of apoptosis, which is actually pretty cool. Now the B cells are involved with your humoral immunity. And there's two major types of B cells. We have memory cells and plasma cells. So once B cells are activated, you know some of these cells will go dormant and store a memory of that infection. That way your, your immune system is ready to uh, remember that infection in the future. Otherwise the plasma cells are the activated B cells that are basically like big old antibody factories. And um, once these cells are activated, um, they divide into clones. You can get a lot of different plasma cells that can really rapidly produce a lot of antibodies. Now, these antibodies are basically short, I'm sorry, the plasma cells are short lived antibody producing factories. And all plasma cells secrete antibodies with identical structure. Now, what these antibodies do is they're little molecular probes that bind specifically to a foreign antigen. Once that antibody binds to a foreign antigen, um, it initiates an immune response that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but once the, the infection dies off those and the antigens are cleared, um, there are some memory cells that will live on to recognize antigens if you're re-exposed to that uh, you know, microorganism. So activation of B cells does require T helper cells as well so that T helper cells release cytokines that also activate B cells. And this um, requires some cell-to-cell -cell contact between B and T cells. Now the cell-to-cell -cell binding of B and T helper cells promotes clonal expansion, which basically means that you can produce more clones of these B cells so they can divide rapidly. And um, this can proliferate and begin antibody synthesis. So um, what happens, you guys, is these antibodies are also called immunoglobulins, and they're basically just protein chains that are um, joined by two identical heavy protein chains that have what are we call disulfide bonds. These, there's five main classes of antibodies. We have IgG, IgM, IgA, D, and E. Um, IgG is the most common. It's also the smallest of your antibodies, so it can really easily escape your bloodstream. Uh, because it's so small, it's it can really easily slip through the spaces between some of the cells that line your blood vessels. And these circulate as single molecules, but they can enter uh, a lot of the interstitial fluids of your body. Now, IgM is the largest. And think about this as like the monster. So IgM is the monster antibody. It consists of five antibody molecules that are joined together to form a pentamer, or sort of five together. It's mostly found in your vascular pool because it's so big it can't cross the capillary wall. It's the first to be produced upon exposure to antigens, and it's the major antibody found on B cell surfaces, and it's one of its main functions to, is to activate complement. We learned earlier that once you activate complement, that does a variety of things like promote the coagulation cascade, um, attract other immune cells to that site of infection, but can also activate the MAC attack complex, which can punch holes into foreign cells. But it's the IgM here. Once it binds to a foreign cell, it can actually activate complement that can punch a hole in that foreign cell. IgA is a dimer. So it's not really small, but it's going to be larger than IgG. It's also produced by plasma cells that you find in tissue or, you know, like skin and mucous membranes. Um, because it's small, um, you can find IgA in, solution, in secretions like saliva, tears, uh, and mucosal secretions like tracheobronchial secretions, as well as colostrum and breast milk. Now, uh, you might wonder, well, why would you find an antibody in certain secretion like saliva, tears, uh, tracheobronchial secretions, and breast milk? Well, this antibody can confer immunity in that regard. So, you know, saliva has antimicrobial aspects because it has antibodies in it. Tears have antimicrobial aspects because they have antibodies in it. And even breast milk has some antimicrobial aspects because it contains its mother's uh, antibodies so that a newborn gets some immunity 
due to uh, you know the absorption of um, these antibodies from the mother. So it's pretty cool. Now IgD is found in more small amounts in your blood. It's located primarily on B cell membranes. And it's thought to be the antigen receptor that acts to stimulate B cells to multiply, differentiate, or secrete other specific immunoglobulins. So IgD seems to have more of like a regulatory aspect in the immune response. Now this differs from IgE because IgE circulates as a single molecule. It um, can be bound to basophils and mast cells. It's found in more trace amounts in serum, but it, it's often involved with immunity against helminthic parasites. Remember, helminths are the worm type parasites. So IgE is associated with parasitic infections, hence the basophil and mast cell association. And therefore, it's also associated with allergic reactions. And this is believed to be involved as a signaling molecule during the uh, parasitic and allergy uh, responses. Now what's interesting though is that although these B cells are antibody factories, they can actually produce different types of antibodies. So antibodies like IgM and IgD can be switched interchangeably uh, between the different types of antibodies. So it's pretty cool. So remember IgM is, is the monster molecule, so it's a large one. And IgM and IgD can be switched to other smaller ones like G, E, and A by what we call class switching. So class switching is influenced by the presence of certain cytokines. So your immune cells can alter what types of antibodies you have present in your body, and that can promote a more effective immune response. And so class switching can be used to identify acute versus chronic infections. So with acute infections, you're going to find a lot of more uh, IgM type of antibodies because those, those are the first that are produced. However, if it's if it's a chronic infection, you're going to be you're going to find a lot more of the smaller type of antibodies because they've had time to class switch from the larger ones like IgM and IgD. Now you might wonder, well, what are the functions of antibodies? You know, we we called them molecular probes earlier, and if these are molecular probes, what are they doing? Well, when these antibodies stick to a foreign cell, they do a couple things. For one, they can precipitate. Uh, cells or substances from your body so they can remove substances from body solutions. These antibodies can also cause cells to agglutinate or clump together and by allowing these foreign cells to clump together they're actually easier to remove in that regard. Now uh, antibodies can also neutralize toxins because if a toxin is bound up to an antibody it can't exert a toxic effect in a tissue and antibodies are also involved with opsonization because they can flag a foreign cell for phagocytosis. So certain phagocytes like macrophages and neutrophils can uh, specifically remove foreign cells that have antibodies stuck to them. Uh, but it turns out that antibodies can also actively complement. And co we know that complements involve with chemotaxis or attracting other immune cells, uh, inflammation, as well as the membrane attack complex or MAC attack complex, which basically punches holes in foreign cells. Now, for the last part of this chapter, what we're going to wrap up with is differentiating passive versus active immunity. And before we get to passive versus active immunity, we should define just generally what is immunity. Well, we know kind of anecdotally that immunity is as a state of resistance against infection. Like if you have an immune response, then you're resisting infection in your body. And it's provided primarily by adequate levels of antibodies and other cells. Now we talk about the concentration of antibodies in your serum as being an antibody titer. And if you have a blood test for antibody titer, you're basically looking for certain antibody concentrations and types of antibodies which can suggest um, different types of immunity that's going on. Now what's interesting is that antibodies can achieve both active and passive immunity. Active immunity is, or actually I'm sorry, we're going to start with passive immunity. So passive immunity is the transfer of preformed antibodies against a specific antigen to an individual. So an example of passive immunity could be like how an infant can receive preformed antibodies from a mother through breast milk. And we would call that naturally acquired passive immunity. So because an infant is naturally getting uh, antibodies through a mother's breast milk, that's a form of naturally acquired passive immunity. There's also other forms of naturally acquired passive immunity, like if, for instance, a fetus can receive antibodies 
through placental transfer. So some of the uh, mother's antibodies can make it through the placenta to aid in um, immunity within a fetus. Now there's also something called artificially acquired passive immunity. And if it's artificial, that means that this is actually being received through sort of medical interventions. So what's interesting is that scientists know how to create certain types of antibodies in a lab. So let's say if you're infected with a, with a known pathogen, like a certain type of virus, well, if you know what type of antibody attacks that virus or pathogen, then scientists can make that antibody in a lab and then inject that specific antibody into someone's body to confer an artificial form of passive immunity. So you can artificially inject uh, preformed antibodies into somebody to confer this passive immunity. So one of the key points with passive immunity is that if someone has passive immunity, they're not making the antibodies themselves. Rather, they're receiving those antibodies from other means. Like if it's, if it's natural, you're receiving it from a mother through breast milk or, or uh, placental transfer. And if it's artificial, you're receiving them in a, in a clinical setting where you might be injected with, with antibodies uh, to help fight an infection. Now, this is used for B cell immunodeficiencies, and um, antibody injection may alleviate or suppress the effects of uh, a particular toxin. So, when we talk about um, when we talk about anti venoms and that kind of stuff, or anti toxins, uh, those are often antibodies against those toxins that we've harvested um, through sort of scientific means, if that makes sense. Now, what, one important note with passive immunity is that it provides immediate but temporary pr protection because if someone's receiving preformed antibodies outside their body, like through brother's, um, sorry, mother's breast milk or through clinical injections, you're not training their body to learn how to make those antibodies on their own. They're just temporarily receiving those antibodies to alleviate that infection. However, the person won't learn how to fight that infection on their own. So that's one, one important note with passive immunity. Now, there's different types of passive immunity. Like you can get uh, mother to fetus transfer, right? So that can cross the placenta. Or mother to infant transfer. We might have IgA in breast milk. Otherwise, you have serotherapy where you might have direct injection of antibodies into, um, you know, from human or animal directly into a patient to help fight infection. Now, this differs from active immunity because active immunity is where an individual's own immune system can produce its own antibodies against infection. Now, this requires memory B cells because memory B cells will store a memory of that infection, and upon its second exposure, you'll get a quicker response. So, active immunity um, would uh, involve things like immunizations because a vaccine can stimulate someone's immune system to develop immune cells against a particular antigen or you know foreign protein. Because vaccines contain foreign antigens, they stimulate um, you know uh, basically immune responses, but they don't have pathogenic properties. So vaccines don't cause disease in an individual. They don't cause harm to the host. Some vaccines contain live or attenuated in live or attenuated agents, but they don't cause disease in the host. But what this does is it, it stimulates a normal immune response in somebody. That way they can produce B cells and T cells against an antigen that, and they can produce their own antibodies against that infection. And because this individual is producing their own antibodies, we call this active immunity. Now, immunizations or vaccines are an example of artificially acquired active immunity because you're artificially injecting a antigen into someone's body. Um, now, what this is showing is the difference between the primary versus secondary immune response. And you can see that with the primary immune response, let's say if we, if we are exposed to a foreign microorganism, it can take 10 or more days before we start producing antibodies against that microorganism. Remember, IgM is the first type of antibody that's produced. And then you can get class switching to smaller antibodies like IgG, but that takes time. And so it's important to note that if you're first exposed to a foreign microorganism, it actually takes time to develop antibodies against that microorganism because 
with this specific adaptive immune response, uh, it's a little bit more slow to develop. However, once you develop immune cells against a specific antigen, those immune cells can differentiate into memory cells and then go dormant in your body, which means the second time you're exposed to that antigen, the response is much quicker. So you can see that instead of taking 10 days to get antibodies produced, it can take as little as three days or even less to start to produce antibodies against that microorganism. So the secondary response is much quicker and much more dramatic. So you get more antibodies pre being produced the second time. But let's talk about this with respect to the um, you know, whole, the whole idea behind vaccination. You know, vaccination simulates the primary stimulus. So if you receive a vaccine, that's like getting a primary immune response. So you get a vaccine and, you know, the antigens float around your bloodstream for some time. And then you, then you develop immune cells that can produce antibodies against those antigens. But let's say that, um, you know, you, those memory cells go dormant. But what about if, if you, on the second stimulus, what if you were really exposed to that microorganism that could cause disease? Well, the, the first time you're exposed to that microorganism is actually like the secondary sim stimulus or response because you've already been exposed to the antigens of that microorganism, which means even though it's the first time you're being exposed to that microorganism, it's almost like you're being exposed for the second time because you already have memories against, against the antigens of that microorganism. So you get antibody production much more quickly, which means you have a stronger immune response upon exposure to that microorganism. Now, one thing that's important to note is that vaccines don't always confer absolute immunity. You know, just because you've, you've had a vaccine against a particular microorganism like influenza or hepatitis uh, doesn't mean you're totally immune. It just means that if you are exposed, your secondary immune response here uh, will kick in and you're going to have a really strong immune response, which means you're more likely to clear off that infection before it causes disease.